Welcome back to the RSET training, large-scale applications of machine learning using remote sensing for building agriculture solutions. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm an RSET trainer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. I want to welcome you all to the third and final part of this webinar series. The following slides provide an overview of the three-part webinar series. The motivations for hosting this training are that timely and accurate in-season crop maps at local to regional scales is crucial for agricultural decision-making and management. Irregularly spaced time series are common with optical satellite images. Training robust models on remote sensing data often requires very large data, but processing and training is complex. The cropland data layer provided by the United States Department of Agriculture's National Agricultural Statistics Service only gives estimates of the types of crops released to the public a few months after the end of the growing season and not their sequence or timing. By the end of this training series, participants will be able to use recommended techniques to download and process remote sensing data from Sentinel-2 and the cropland data layer at large scale with cloud tools, produce interactive plots of maps, tables, time series for investigation and verification of data, and models. Filter data from both the measured and target domains to serve modeling objectives based on quality factors, land classification, area of interest overlap, and geographical location. Build training pipelines in TensorFlow to train machine learning algorithms on large-scale remote sensing geospatial datasets for agricultural monitoring. And utilize random sampling techniques to build robustness into a predictive algorithm while avoiding information leakage across training, validation, and testing splits. The prerequisites for the three-part training are a general understanding of Python programming in Databricks from parts one and two, access to the associated data from parts one and two, and to sign up for and access the Databricks community edition. This slide shows the training outline for each part of the webinar series. All materials, code, and recordings from each session can be accessed from the training webpage. Homework opens today, March 19th, and will be due on April 1st you can access the homework from the training page. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment before the given due date. Please put your questions in the question box and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. Feel free to enter your questions as we go. We will try to get to all the questions during the question and answer session after the presentations and demonstrations have concluded. The remainder of the questions will be answered in the Q&A document, which will be posted to the training website by the end of next week. It is now my pleasure to reintroduce our guest instructors for today's webinar, Dr. John Just and Eric Sorensen. Dr. Just is a principal data scientist at John Deere and an affiliate assistant professor at Iowa State University in the Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering Department. Mr. Sorensen is a senior data scientist at John Deere, where he utilizes large-scale remote sensing data and machine learning to unlock insights and efficiencies for agricultural producers. John and Eric, over to you. All right, thanks, John. I'm John, I'm one of your trainers here. Uh, I'm a principal data scientist at John Deere. I'm also an affiliate faculty at Iowa State University. And with me is Eric. Eric, can you introduce yourself? Hi all, um, I'll be go going over the uh, code part of this session today. Uh, my name is Eric Sorensen. I'm a senior data scientist at, at John Deere. And welcome to our uh, third part in this training series. We're going over in this one, uh, the training and testing of machine learning models for the irregularly spaced time series of imagery. Um, again, this is the third part of our series on large scale applications of machine learning using remote sensing. Our objectives in this part is that at the end or by the end, participants will be able to use Python and data rich community or uh, really any other Python environment to set up and train a 1D convolutional neural network. And that model is intended to learn to detect crop type from a time series of imagery. Uh, that imagery is, this is all built on the previous sessions, the previous two parts where we learned how to uh, process and, and really get that data and then uh, develop a data loader that will feed the model training process. Um, we're also gonna learn how to uh, monitor, monitor the model training process. Uh, and this is important for diagnosis, uh, also for model selection, hyperparameter adjustments. And then finally, we're gonna visualize the model output in various ways that allow us to really validate the performance of the model. 
So we have uh, just a few slides here, um, pretty sparse, but we're gonna focus in on a, a couple of the TensorFlow modules that are helpful here. One of them is Keras, the other one's uh, TensorBoard. So uh, Keras is what helps us really build the model and, and train it. Um, it does the heavy lifting for us. So uh, just a reminder in the process. So part one, we built the data set as mentioned. Um, part two, we built the data loader. Uh, that's gonna feed the model training. And then this part, we're focused on training the model and then uh, testing it with inference. So Keras has a lot of modules in it. It's, it's, um, it's kind of a high level uh, interface to TensorFlow. And within that, um, it's, it's got, while it's a high level interface, it also has some flexibility to define custom layers and uh, loss functions and uh, other metrics and callbacks. So uh, here in this slide, we have a lot of links to some relevant uh, submodules within Keras, but uh, there's actually more than what's shown here. We'll cover a couple of these. We use um, we use all these in some sense in this particular uh, demo that we we uh, produce here. Um, some of the some of the most important ones are the layers where we actually build a model. So. Uh, this is an example of uh, a very small um, convolutional, 1D convolutional neural network. Um, it's not far off from what Eric will show in the demo, but it's just a it's just a simple example of how you can very quickly, with a few lines of code, uh, pretty much put together a, a 1D convolutional network model. And um, once you put that together, you can you can actually uh, use um, just with dot notation again, you know, model dot summary, and uh, that will output um, essentially the architecture of your model. And you can see how many parameters you're going to need to train with that model, and um, kind of make sure that it's 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 coming together with the right sizes that you expect. Um, this this helps you also uh, kind of limit um, in case you you didn't expect there to be a, an enormous number of parameters for one particular layer or part of your model, you can kind of identify you know if there's any any issues with your model. So and then also you can see if if somehow the the shape of any given layer doesn't match what you would expect. I mean, Keras will make some assumptions for you, so you you kind of usually want to check this just to be sure uh, everything works out the way you expect from the input to output. So uh, another big part of the Keras module and really the model training process is losses and optimizers. Um, in mathematical terms, the loss function, the model, and the data determine the the structure of your optimization manifold. So in the in the example to the right here, we have a little GIF where we're kind of showing the optimization process over a surface. Um, in this case, the global minimum, the one you'd want to uh, obtain, is this deeper hole right here and uh, you know, when you start the optimization process, you're somewhere outside of that and you're trying to reach that location. And so uh, this in this particular example, the marbles represent different optimizer options and kind of how fast they might converge or, and where they might converge to. You'd, you would want to avoid a, what's called a local uh, optimization point and, and try to achieve the, the more global optimization point. And in practice, this is far more complicated for most uh, models and data and loss functions, but uh, this does serve as a, as a great visual of how the process works. And so um, for this demo, the loss function we use is a probabilistic multi-class classification loss. That's because we have uh, like six, as we as we shared in the, the last training session, we have six different categories that we're trying to predict. Um, so that, that in, in this case, we use what's called Categorical cross entropy loss, and then our optimizer we use is Adam. It's it's a very common uh, uh, optimization uh, routine. So um, these are all pretty standard, and they work really well in Keras. Um, so the training process is actually quite easy uh, in Keras. Once you have your model defined, and um, you know you know what loss function you're going to use, uh, what optimizer you're going to use. And then you kind of know what metrics you want to monitor. You can just uh, really slap it all together uh, with a few different uh, calls. So here we've got, again, some examples of that. So assuming we've defined our model, um, we then define a few callbacks. So those callbacks are things like early stopping and uh, 
in this case, also TensorBoard, where we what we use to monitor the the training process. Early stopping is a way to prevent overfitting, and we talked a little bit about that in part two, what that looks like. So we we use our validation data set to do that. Um, we also compile the model. That's where we specify the the loss, the optimizer, and the metrics. So we kind of put it all together, and then we just run the training loop by by calling model dot fit, and then we specify the data set and a few other parameters here. Um, you know, that includes our, our callbacks and uh, validation data set. And then uh, ultimately, you know, you can choose if you want to, if you want to see a lot of output from that process in the terminal or not. Um, you know, our primary way of monitoring this will be though the, the TensorBoard uh, visuals. So uh, TensorBoard is also something we want to cover real quickly. It's, it's a really powerful tool. Um, it's, it's part of TensorFlow and it's used primarily for uh, providing the, the measurements and visualizations that we want to uh, monitor during the, the, the machine learning workflow or training process. Uh, it's it's actually quite a unique library. You know, there's competing uh, ML tools like PyTorch, um, which, you know, can be substituted for TensorFlow, but uh, TensorBoard itself is, is unique enough that PyTorch still uses TensorBoard too for monitoring. Uh, so this is, a, this is a very useful module to know. Um, regardless of what you like to use for your uh, model training framework. Um, some features I, I, I kind of listed here, you can track and view metrics such as loss and accuracy. Um, you can view the model graph if that's something you want to see. Uh, you can look at histograms of weights and biases and other things as they change over time. So you get these time series plots of histograms, which are which can be useful or interesting uh, to detect some some issues or unexpected occurrences. Um, you can do very fancy things like projecting embeddings to lower dimensional spaces. We're not gonna cover that here, but uh, just note that, you know, these are keywords you could Google and find some examples of. It's quite interesting and useful for advanced modeling. Um, and then we can, uh, one, one really useful thing is you can have some very custom plots that you make in the background, perhaps with mop, matplotlib, and you can view those uh, during the training process as they change. Um, and then another really useful feature we don't use here, but I suggest for people that are new to this that want to try it out, um, uh, the TensorFlow uh, profiling uh, tool is quite useful for learning how where bottlenecks exist in the, the model loading and training uh, process. So it doesn't work very well in Databricks community, but it's something that if you were to set up on your computer and play around with like a, a local laptop or something, um, it, it's a very useful tool for learning. Um, so these are some examples of what some of the views in TensorBoard could look like. Um, the, the left here is the most standard types of views where we're viewing the metrics. So we've got things like accuracy, we've got the, um, we can monitor the loss function over time. And uh, this, is, this is your primary diagnostics tool. In fact, once you've trained lots of models and you understand how the the the, the curves look and should look, um, this is a this is a very rapid way to diagnose if something's not uh, training properly or you should you should be changing something. Um, this is also a quick way to compare models because it will actually um, over time if you train more and more models that those will those will all show up here and you'll see the difference between the models. So it's again it's a very quick way to see if what you're doing is headed in the right direction. Um, Another thing that we can uh, observe, I mentioned, you can do some very custom image plots. Um, in this case, uh, we have a confusion matrix that's being viewed, and, and so this is generated externally, and then you can kind of bring it into TensorBoard and view these, uh, these custom plots. And they can, again, be very useful for things that are um, maybe a little bit more custom. I mentioned the, the TensorBoard profiler, and I, I kind of note it here again. So you can kind of see what it looks like, but it gives you, once you run it, it gives you recommendations on where your bottlenecks are in the process. So for instance, if you have a, a long uh, wait time for data to actually arrive so that your 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 data loader can work with it. So there's like a, a network um, delay uh, of some kind, you can identify that here or if you're, so, so if you're network limited or your compute limited or your memory limited in some way, um, you can identify those types of bottlenecks or problems here with the profiler. And you kind of learn over time, um, you get an intuition for uh, how to optimize a, 
a, a training process, you know, end to end. So uh, again, this can this can be really useful, especially when you're starting out and trying to learn uh, about how to optimize a training process. Once you have a good feel for this, um, you know what to look for in the future too. So you can optimize your process. All right, so on to the demo. Um, just a few notes before we jump into the demo. Uh, Again, Databricks, this is just an overview of Databricks community. If you need to sign up, um, there's a link here. A uh, few notes about it. We've talked about this in part one, I believe, but it's Jupyter Notebook style coding. Uh, the nice part about Databricks community is they allow up to 10 gigabytes persistent storage. So you know, once the instance shuts down, you still can keep your storage uh, intact. And so you, well, you can start up a new instance later, come back, and work with the same data. So that's that's a very nice feature about Databricks community. Um, and it, it really allows you to store a lot of different types of files. Uh, and and we, we talked more about that in the workspace, uh, about the workspace in the part one, and um, you, you'll see it in some of the demos as well as we're, we're working with the data. Um, the instance types have two, you don't get to change any of this, but they have two CPUs, 15 gigabytes RAM and 130 gigabytes local storage. Um, and then you can work with PySpark right out of the box. Uh, if anything that you store in the local instance, so on in the, in the 130 gigabytes of local storage on the cluster that's lost when it's shut down, and uh, generally speaking, the notebook will shut down uh, after about 50 minutes of non-use. So as long as you're interacting with the notebook, you shouldn't have any problems though. Um, for this particular demo, a few notes uh, that we'll have the available scripts, or we'll have the scripts and and um, and the data available in the in the training uh, folder and the, on the website. Um, so you know all the training data, all the scripts you'll need are, are out there on the website. Um, the uh, I, we do want to make a note that the it, and, and Eric will talk more about this, but the the model and the training process they've, we've not exhaustively tuned these uh, with hyperparameter searches. So that's something for uh, the participants to be able to play around with. Um, Trying some different models, trying some different learning rates on the optimizer, um, different perhaps different splits on the data, whatever whatever uh, you'd like to try out, and uh, see if you can get better better scores on the model. Um, so that's that's kind of a fun thing you can you can do. It's pretty easy to do with Keras. Uh, and then some notes on if you need to download things. It's a it it can be a little bit um, tricky. You just need to go to a specific uh, path in the web browser to download things. So. Again, that's just here for reference. So, all right, and with that, we'll head on to the demo with Eric. Thanks. All right, thanks, John. Um, I'll be covering the demo portion of part three um, within Databricks Community Edition. Um, so again, some some friendly reminders here. Um, so this is a the part three notebook that once you create an account with Databricks Community Edition, following the instructions on the training website, um, this Python file will be made available to you. Um, you can upload it by going to your workspace in Databricks and then uploading uh, using the import. If you go into your files, import, and then you can upload that Python file um, as a notebook here, and then you can go into it and run the code run the code along uh, with me here. Um, also, this is an extension of kind of part two. Uh, we'll use a lot of the same code um, to load in the data from part two. Um, and again, similarly to part two, we ran this with the Databricks runtime 13.3 LTS version, which you can specify when you go to create your cluster. If you create a new resource, uh, you can specify that runtime here uh, using the 13.3 LTS when you create your cluster. I mentioned before, this is just an extension of part two. Um, and so actually the first few commands that we'll run in this notebook are the same um, as part two, where we're just loading in the data, including the training data, um, installing our necessary packages. Um, but we do add a few packages uh, to part three, um, including the, the contextually geopandas and image IO packages. Um, we install them with pip in the first command and then load them in here. Um, the contextually and geopandas packages we'll just use for uh, for plotting our model results um, geospatially. 
We are also going to create some time series GIFs of the results using ImageIO. And then sklearn is already actually installed um, on the cluster uh, and DBR 13.3 LTS. And so we'll just import this as well. sklearn will use it for uh, quickly generating some model metrics like accuracy. We'll also validate we're still using the same TensorFlow version 2.15 along with TensorFlow IO 0.36. Um, and again, this is the same code that we modified in, in part two. Um, again, we're going to be loading in our data files, which are um, zip files um, here, which are also available um, in the training documentation uh, that you can download for yourselves. To upload, uh, again, a reminder to upload these, these data files, you can go into your data catalog here, um, go into the DBFS, the Databricks file store, um, I saved the data into this tables folder, and you can go and select the uh, upload button, and then you can drag and drop those zip files up here to upload them into the Databricks file store. Once they're uploaded into the Databricks file store, you can do a uh, you can do this command, the fs, um, and to list all the data in the file store uh, under the tables format to confirm that your uh, zip file, the data zip files, were um, properly loaded into the Databricks file store. Similarly to part two, we're going to copy the data from the file store to lo our local disk, or the local driver node that is currently running this notebook, and then unzip the contents to um, get to our base Parquet files. For part three, we're primarily concerned about just the uh, test data set. Uh, we're not going to be dealing with any of the, the train uh, or VAL um, once we validate our model, but when we train the model in this part, we'll be using the train val uh, data set uh, that's unzipped here. Um, and again, we can validate um, that the data was loaded in properly using some visualizations, um, and then validate that we have uh, actual data files that we'll be loading in for our train and validation data loaders that we defined in part two. Uh, the same project variables are defined with 120 days in series. Um, again, we covered this in more detail in part two, and we're just rerunning this code because this is necessary uh, when training the model in this part. Uh, again, load all the, 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 the data files into a TensorFlow data set, and then define our custom labeling function, our bucketing function, and our parsing function uh, and our filtering functions that we'll use to create our training and validation data sets. So once this is all ran, um, then we can kind of skip. I'll skip over the kind of uh, performance metrics that we did in part two, that we went over in more detail in part two. And then we'll skip to kind of the new stuff, the part three model training. So once we have all of our validation and training data sets defined, all the data is loaded in, we can now uh, go into training our model our 1D uh, convolutional neural network model. So the first thing that we'll do here is define some of our constants, um, including uh, the number of features that we're using, which is our 12 bands of Sentinel-2 uh, data. The max epochs are going to run our model, uh, which is 40 in this case. Um, this is a, this was tested uh, to fit within kind of that 60 minute uh, time frame where Databricks will cut you off. So you should be able to run this uh, within Databricks Community Edition to create a fully trained model uh, using 40 epochs. Ideally, if you had a more compute and Databricks uh, kind of didn't cut you off with that 60 minutes, you could run uh, train the model for a longer period of time, which might improve its performance. Um, and there's also, you can kind of reset the timer if you wanted to uh, by kind of going into a different notebook and just running any commands using the same cluster, and that'll kind of reset that clock. So you can, uh, within Databricks Community Edition, train your model for, for more epochs for longer than an hour. We're also going to define this uh, uh, ES patients parameter, which will define uh, how our early stopping patients uh, will work. Here we just set it to max epoch, so we're not actually going to kind of reset uh, or stop the model early uh, because 40 epochs is, is kind of a low number. Um, and so for this kind of demo to fit within that time period, uh, we don't actually uh, do any early stopping here. Um, but this will still save the best model that was trained um, during the uh, training iterations. Then lastly, we're going to define uh, the model save name. Here, we're gonna just going to name it model underscore, and then the, that training days in series window, which is currently set to 120 days, and we'll save that as a Keras file. 
Lastly, uh, or not lastly, uh, in continuation, uh, TensorBoard can be loaded in Databricks. Uh, they, they provide a built-in kind of module uh, to load in TensorBoard and to, to, to activate TensorBoard interactivity um, within Databricks. And so to do that, you have to load kind of this extension using this command to load in TensorBoard. Um, and then you can run things, you can run TensorBoard commands with the uh, magic parentheses parameter um, to kind of initialize the TensorBoard um, environment within the driver node cluster. And the only thing you need to set is kind of where you want to store the TensorBoard logs. Um, we, st we store them here in the uh, local driver nodes uh, temporary file system. So once we do that, and you will see here that'll kind of say some things, um, and then you can actually open in a new tab, and we'll get into that to see the TensorBoard visualization as your model's training. So once that's set up, then we're ready to go to actually start our model training um, and define how our model looks like. Um, so first, we kind of need to define our input shape, uh, which should be the batch size that we defined earlier, the max images per series, which is um, I think 25, uh, based, which is based on our 120 days bucketed every five days, um, and then our number of features, which is 12. Um, with that, um, we specify a model with very similar architecture that's just a little bit bigger um, than the one shown in the slides. Uh, with We have uh, two back-to-back -back, uh, convolutional 1D layers that has padding uh, as default set to keep it to the same size with filters set to 64 on both and a kernel size of 5 with the activation of ReLU. Um, the input shape is important to define here for what the first uh convolutional 1d is this that sets the kind of shape and of expectation of what the input shape and the data shape looks like for the model we also what's different i think in this one is we add dropout and uh, this was not included in the slides uh, dropout is just a method to improve model generalization and is one of the hyperparameters that you can tune as by setting how much dropout you would like to add here um, here we just set it to, to 0.5, which means it will drop out 50% of the weights or set them to zero uh, before it gets on to the next step. Um, then we apply max pooling, a flattened step, and then two dense layers, one with 50 hidden units. Um, and then the last dense layer must have a size that is our number of labels. Uh, so here we actually have seven labels, um, which are defined above. And then we'll apply softmax, which is uh, necessary because we'll be using the categorical cross entropy loss function, um, which we define in the next steps. So that's our model architecture. Um, we can actually define kind of a view the model architecture by using the model.summary uh, call uh, that we showed in the summary, which will give a useful overview of the number of parameters along with the different shapes uh, at each layer in the model. Um, so we can kind of take a view of this, and this looks um, about right. Uh, we can also get, get a useful kind of model size. Uh, if we save this to disk, if, you know, we were training large models, this might be a concern. But in this case, uh, you know, 197 kilobytes will easily fit within our um, uh, memory uh, for the Databricks runtime, or Databricks Community Edition. Next, we'll need to define some callbacks. Uh, the two callbacks that we use um, in this training is the early stopping callback, which will uh, monitor the validation loss and save the model or end the model training if the validation loss does not improve for a number of steps defined by the ES patients. And then we'll define the TensorBoard callback, uh, which is necessary so that the Keras will save TensorBoard logs into the defined directory, which needs to be the same as um, this directory here so that we can visualize the model performance as it's training. And then lastly, we do a compile step, uh, which defines your loss function, the optimizer that you want to use, and any metrics that you want to track. The nice thing about Keras is that you can actually, they, they provide some pre-built metrics, uh, such as categorical accuracy, but you can add in any additional custom metrics if you would like. So for example, if you wanted to, say, track the model's performance on one specific label, its accuracy, um, you could do so. So for example, if we wanted to define a custom 
uh, accuracy for just soybeans, uh, we could define that here using a custom loss function and then add that into our metrics that we want to track. So that's one of the nice things about Keras is it provides um, some easy uh, pre-built metrics that are popular just to get you going, but it also allows you the capability of creating some custom things if you wanted to take a deeper look. So now that we have all the things defined for the model, we can simply call the model.fit function to start model training using our training data set that we defined in part two and our validation data set. Um, we can specify for how long we want it to train and then pass in the callbacks um, that we want uh, to give it, uh, including the, the early stopping and the fetch report callbacks that we called before. So I've already trained, uh, pre kind of ran this, this, this code uh, before uh, this uh, training, just so we don't have to wait, you know, 50 minutes. Um, but this actually has finished and concluded um, its training step, and it's reached a categorical accuracy of 85% on the training set, um, and a categorical accuracy of 82% on the validation set, which are pretty solid performance um, for just kind of a base model. And we can actually go into TensorBoard by clicking that uh, open a new tab button in Databricks, which will open up kind of a console so we can view our TensorBoard performance of model training um, live as the model is actually training. And so we can see here um, there's some, some batch uh, accuracy uh, that we can monitor, uh, the batch loss, the losses as, as, uh, per batch as the model's training. And then we can also see um, after each epoch the results of both the train and the validation set um, and, and the, the loss curves, uh, the, the accuracy curves, and as well as the loss curves. Um, at first look, this curve looks pretty healthy. It doesn't seem to be um, overfitting. Uh, it might, you know, if it, if it was training for a little bit longer, uh, it might be starting to overfit. Um, but right now, just at first glance, this looks like a pretty healthy training curve. Um, there are some other useful tools um, within TensorBoard that I'll, I'll briefly share, um, including uh, you can kind of see the, the graph of the model if you really wanted to debug and if you're doing some custom things. This is somewhat useful to see how Keras is actually defining your, your model. Um, but one thing that we did mention in the slides is that there's kind of this profile or tool. Um, we did not... Uh, do this within the Databricks Community Edition, but if you go here, um, they do give you some instructions on how you can set up the profile plugin, um, and you can install it using this in your own system to get it working. So that TensorBoard will kind of enable this uh, as a new um, tab up here, so you can monitor your uh, training performance uh, within TensorBoard. And as you can see with this drop down, there's a lot of other things as well, uh, other modules that TensorBoard. Um, allows you to, to track your model performance over time, including kind of viewing your histograms or um, images if you're working with image data or audio data, uh, text data. And there's a lot of different modules here that TensorBoard has pre-built in uh, that are useful for debugging your model while it's training. So I mentioned we already kind of pre-trained a model here. Um, oh, one last thing before I go there. Um, so just to mention, uh, we kind of briefly mentioned hyperparameter tuning um, in the slides. Um, no hyperparameter tuning was was done on this model uh, that we defined here. Um, we just kind of took some some default uh, 1D CNN models from the Keras documentation and threw it in um, into this pipeline uh, using our data, um, and that's it. So. We still got pretty solid performance, um, but there's definitely some room for improvement here by doing some hyperparameter tuning, by tuning the model parameters and the model architecture uh, to maximize performance on, on this training problem. So some things that you can tune um, as part of next steps uh, for improving the model would be you know, test different model sizes or architectures, you know, number of filters or number of hidden units, making the model bigger or smaller. You could test different activation functions, maybe instead of ReLU, you could try something like uh, TanH uh, or Sigmoid. Uh, optimize optimizers and learning rates. Um, you could play around with different um, learning rates. Uh, we just went with the default Atom, uh, default learning rate that Atom Optimizer and Keras uses. You could also try other things like um, changing the dropout or removing dropout entirely or try other regularizers uh, if the model looks to be overfitting, 
things like L1 and L2 regularization can be added as part of the model training process. And then you can also uh, test with uh, different early stopping patients parameters. So these are just a few of the things uh, that would be good next steps to do if you wanted to really maximize the performance of this model. Um, and we'll leave that um, for you to, to play around with after uh, you kind of set up in your own environments. So again, a reminder, uh, any model saved here, uh, if you save it on the driver node, will be deleted. And so you want to make sure that the model that you spent uh, a lot of time training and, and hyperparameter tuning, uh, a, lot, a lot of work uh, to, to train it, you want to save it so you can, you can use it later. And you can do that in Databricks by persisting it to the Databricks file store. Um, you can first save it to your local machine, and then you can copy that file um, to the Databricks file store. And then once you do that, you can also, if you wanted to download it to your local, uh, you can navigate to this file uh, to actually download that Keras file to your local system. Okay, so now that we have a trained model, we can move on to testing its performance and visualizing it and um, seeing how it, how it performed throughout the year. Uh, so though, again, the kind of interesting aspects of training a a model uh, that uh, training a model on time series of satellite imagery is that you have both the geospatial and time aspects uh, to test your model on. Uh, the time aspect is kind of the the interesting part uh, that we're kind of focusing on this on, on here because the model can perform quite dramatically different depending on the, the time of year uh, that the crops are growing in. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit. But we want to test our model and see how it performs throughout the whole year at different parts of the growing season. And so here we're defining um, kind of s some date ranges that we want to get model results for, um, including kind of the beginning of the year up to 200 plus 120 days, which is our, our time for the bucket, uh, which results into um, pretty close to the end of the year, I think in November. John mentioned in the slides that you know, as we're we're testing this, uh, we want to define another test uh, data set or a test function, test parsing function that removes randomness um, because we don't want any randomness when we're actually you know doing inference in the real world. Uh, we, for example, we don't want to randomly sample imagery. We want to use all of the imagery that's available to us uh, in our pipeline or time series. And as we're testing, we want to be able to define the time range and the window that we're pulling imagery for. Um, and so those are the, the biggest change here is that we are adding, uh, this is the same train data set, uh, the parser function that we use in the training data set as before with just some minor adjustments. So the first thing is we are setting, uh, so we can specify the date range that we want to look at by setting the start day of the time series. Um, that is used here to grab the uh, that time range. Instead of randomly sampling the time range, we'll now just select the time range specified. And then we're also commenting out the part of the code where we randomly sampled images uh, because we want to use all of the imagery available that we have. The rest of this code is the same um, until we get down to the bottom where we actually will return some additional parameters that'll be useful for plotting our results. So like before, we still have our, you know, our X and our Y that's normalized in the same way that it was in our training data set. Um, but we'll also pass the coordinates of the time series, the longitude and latitude, as well as the raw cropland data layer label. So that would just be useful for debug debugging and visualization. Next, we did save that, that trained model uh, in the Databricks file store, so we're just going to load that in here um, using the TEF Keras models .load model function. We're going to create that um, test TensorFlow data set like we did before. And then this block of code looks a little scary and a little complex, but all this is really doing is what we want to do is get a bunch of results from our trained model throughout different points uh, of the year. Um, so things we're going to be storing as our predicted value, the, the true value, 
uh, the longitude and latitude location of where that prediction is made or that time series is made, as well as the rock cropland data la labels. Um, and then we're going to iterate through kind of that date range that we specified before, which has just a bunch of different start dates throughout the year. Load that into our custom test data lower data loader that we defined before um, by pass and passing in the start day as the additional parameter. And then looping through making the predictions uh, using our model to predict on the data. Um, getting the argmax, we actually get the label instead of one hot encoded values. Uh, getting the true value, and then appending and saving that into lists and caching the longitude, latitudes, and corrupt, uh, this raw CDL values as well. Um, so that's already run for us. Um, the last thing we do once we have all those data in lists is we'll just concatenate that into an easy to work with uh, pandas data frame. Um, and then once we have that data frame, that results data frame, we can compute things like the accuracy over the whole year on the test data set, and we get a total accuracy of about 75%, which is lower than our validation accuracy, uh, which got up to about 83%, uh, which is a little bit, uh, you know, different, not maybe something that we would expect. So we're going to dive into the details here and, and see, you know, why the test set accuracy is a little bit lower um, just for this specific example. Um, and lastly, again, uh, another reminder to always save any of this uh, data that you want to, to use in future sessions, save that to the Databricks file store so it's persisted and not lost once your driver node uh, shuts down. Okay, now that we have that results data frame, we can go and, and do some visualizations and dig uh, really deep into uh, how our model performed at different points of the year. So first we're going to um, read in that results table that we saved to the Databricks file store. And then these three lines, all they're doing is kind of creating a more human readable uh, date uh, for our prediction results, um, which just uses kind of that start date that we specified, um, adds that 120 day bucket window. Um, the test predictions were from the year, and then from that we can create an actual uh, timestamp uh, when the results, uh, when the predictions were made. And so this is kind of the result of that final uh, results table, and we get the latitude and longitude for where the prediction was made. We get the raw cropland data layer label, uh, as well as the start day that the, the predictions were made with the true label from our custom labeler, and then the prediction, uh, the predicted value for uh, what our model predicted, as well as that prediction date that we just made. So with that, the first thing that we're going to show is a confusion matrix, which displays the accuracy uh, of our uh, algorithm across the entire year uh, or throughout the entire year and comparing performance across different or different labels. Um, and so this looks pretty solid. There's some things that, that jump out, but how we read this is if we look at kind of how our model predicted on uncultivated label, uh, we can see it predicted with 90% accuracy, the uncultivated label, um, which, is, which is quite good. But if we move on to the cultivated label, uh, we can see uh, it predicted correctly the cultivated label about 12% of the time. Uh, most of the time, misclassifying cultivated areas as corn. Um, so that's um, something that was kind of expected. Uh, we discussed this in part two, that our data label representation cultivated was by far the lowest represented in our data set. And so it was kind of expected that our model would perform the worst uh, on the cultivated label, just because it doesn't have that much data uh, in its training pipeline uh, to use to, to learn what the cultivated pixels look like. Uh, it's good at predicting the no crops growing with about 80% accuracy, um, but also its highest misclassification rate is uncultivated, which for our purposes, it's not too bad, um, as uncultivated and no crops growing probably look pretty similar. Um, so that's pretty good. Although the one biggest outlier that we see here is its uh, performance on soybeans seems, uh, at first glance, looks to be pretty bad, which is uh, not expected as soybeans was our, as one of our largest represented labels in our data set. Um, and so that's definitely suspect, and we're going to want to dig deeper into, you know, is that truly only predicting soybeans 25% of the time accurately, um, you know, what's going on here. Um, but we can see that 
most of the time. For soybeans, it's misclassifying it as either cotton or uncultivated. Um, but then for rice, corn, and cotton, the performance looks uh, pretty steady, pretty pretty solid. Um, so it's able to predict rice, corn, and cotton throughout the growing season uh, with pretty high accuracy, which is the uh, default 1DC in a model that we defined before. All right, so the other thing that we want to, that would be useful to see is the model's prediction accuracy throughout the year. Um, what we would kind of expect is maybe at the, you know, bef before the early growing season, uh, the model accuracy is, is not as good as maybe there's not as much data to identify the crops. Um, and we can kind of see that uh, as the model accuracy is going down as we kind of get into the early growth stage, uh, maybe of the crops going into um, June. Uh, Mid-June, the, the model accuracy is actually the worst. Um, but then as the crops mature um, later in the growth stage, as we get more images and data available to monitor the crops and make a prediction on, um, the model accuracy uh, bumps up back to around uh, 70, 76%. Um, and then interestingly, you know, very late in the season, uh, you know, October, uh, September time range, the model accuracy is actually the best, which also makes sense um, given that the model's quite good at predicting uncultivated and no crops growing, and at the end of the season when the crops are all harvested, that's going to be the most common label. And so its performance is, uh, it makes sense that the performance would jump in, in late of the season. But we definitely want to kind of take a deeper dive into why the model is maybe performing the worst at this timestamp. And so we can plot this geospatially to see, you know, what's really going on in the model's predictions. Um, so first, we're going to just take a look at the predictions on the worst performing date by filtering our results table um, to 45, which is when the uh, predictions were the worst. We're going to convert that data frame into a geo pandas data frame, which just offers some additional functionality um, by including the latitude and latitude as a geometry kind of metadata as part of this data frame, which allows for easier plotting of geospatial data. We're also going to define uh, the cropland data layer color scheme so that these colors match the same colors that you would see in the CDL uh, website. Um, these colors were extracted. They actually provide the color values um, in this Excel file. And so these color values were set to match those um, from this file. And then what we're going to show here is we're actually going to create uh, two plots, one that plots the, the true label from our custom labeler, and one that plots our predicted values um, over time and uh, over space, given the latitude and longitude coordinates. So this is what the resulting plot looks like um, for the worst performing date in our time series, which is early in, in early June or mid-June. We can see that, as expected, the model actually performs quite well um, the predicted model, the predicted, uh, the predictions of the model are shown on the right, and the true values uh, of the labeler is shown on the left. Um, we can see that it performs quite well on on corn and rice uh, early on in the season, uh, with some misclassifications, uh, maybe on rice uh, for corn. But we definitely see that it's there's a big misclassification of soybeans. Uh, it's Actual, in actuality, these red fields are cotton fields, uh, and it's misclassifying these cotton fields as soybeans. And so that could be due to multiple different reasons. Maybe the uh, growth structure early on uh, in the season for, you know, when the, when the plant's not mature and very young, it might look very similar between cotton and soybeans from satellite imagery. It could be also that the model just needs to train a little bit longer to make this distinction um, better. Um, and, you know, perhaps with better hyperparameter tuning, the model would be able to perform better uh, earlier on in the season for soybeans. It's also worth noting that um, the black pixels denote kind of where there's no crops are growing. Um, as our, our, That's kind of our special label uh, that we defined. If there was, you know, crops, if the cropland data layer label says that there's crops growing, but there's no recent vegetation, we'll label that as that there's no crops currently growing um, in that. And so there is, you know, a decent amount of black uh, labeling here, um, which makes sense due to it being very early in the growing season. Uh, and so likely there's not much vegetation that exists. And so that's also to be expected here. 
Okay, so this is again the worst performing prediction date, um, which is somewhat to be as expected as this is you know predicting on young crops, um, but does show why our model was predicting uh, had low prediction performance on soybeans as it was misclassifying as cotton very early on in the season. So now let's take a look to the same exact plot, but we'll do the the same plot on the best performing date in the time series. Um, and this is in uh, mid-August when the crops are, are very mature. Uh, and there's a lot more data to work with, so it's, it makes sense that the model performs better on this date. Um, and we can see um, it has flipped its predictions. Uh, it misclassified the cotton as soybeans and is now correctly identifying most of these fields, uh, the cotton fields, as correctly cotton. Um, rice is still, rice and corn prediction is still quite well, but we can see, you know, maybe this is the end of the current corn season and these corn fields may have been harvested. Um, it's correctly identifying that, you know, there's no crops growing, um, which is uh, to be as expected. But two things definitely stand out from the best performing plot here. Um, there's one, um, there are two kind of smaller plots of lands that are labeled as cultivated that the model identifies as cotton. Um, again, looking at that confusion matrix, this is expected as the model is not very good at predicting uh, cultivated areas, just likely due to the low sample size it has in the trainings data set. So one next step could be to add and find more data of the cultivated data uh, in its training set so that it can better classify these areas uh, as cultivated. Um, the other big thing that stands out here is that it's predicting soybeans up in this top right where the true value label is predicting uh, or it says it's uncultivated. Um, and it looks like this model uh, is pretty confident, or at least this whole field is looks to be soybeans. And so this is definitely an outlier um, that we'll want to investigate. Uh, we can do that by, uh, I, I did that by plotting the raw uh, cropland data layer uh, values that's not manipulated from our custom labeling function, just to see what, what the original value of that was. Um, and this is very similar code as what was done before, um, but just also defining custom uh, cropland data layer uh, color scheme that matches their color scheme on their web tool uh, that were pulled from that same Excel file. And so when looking at this, you know, kind of upper right uh, hand corner farm plot, um, we can see that this is actually a double cropping of winter wheat and soybeans. And so the really neat thing is that our model is actually probably predicting the correct crop here, um, even though our labeler says it's uncultivated. Um, it's actually likely um, actually soybeans are growing here. So one of the cool things that we can do uh, with this model, uh, since it can make predictions in real time, is actually delineate um, between which crops are growing for the double crops, uh, double cropped label uh, areas of the cropland data layer. Uh, as the cropland data layer doesn't tell you, you know, when the double croppings occurred, you know, which one went first or which ones were planted at what times, um, our model can actually make this delineation um, by correctly classifying that there's soybeans growing in, you know, late August. Um, so that's something that, that uh, is unlocked by kind of this, this process, which is pretty exciting. So lastly, um, it would be really good to get kind of a whole holistic view of a time series of of our model's performance over the whole growing season. Um, and the easiest way to do that, there's multiple ways you can do that um, with different plotting functions. The easiest way I found to do that is by creating a GIF that is kind of just a slideshow of uh, multiple matplotlib uh, saved PNGs uh, across the growing season. And so that's what we're doing here. This is the same plotting code as before. It's just looping through and creating multiples based on the different um, views that we've created across uh, the year and time. And so the only important difference here is that we're actually saving these figures as PNG files that will later in the next step compile into one GIF. But Databricks also does display all of these figures across time. Um, down here below. 
of note, um, as we kind of expected, you know, early on in the growing season, uh, this is uh, late April. Uh, we'll see that there's, you know, a lot of labels that are no crops growing, um, which makes sense as they're, um, you know, these, these fields are very young and there's probably no emergence. Um, and so it's able to predict most of these as no crops growing um, and why its prediction performance is actually quite well, because all these labels are, are pretty uniform. Uh, but then we can see as the crops start to grow, you know, in mid-May, uh, corn and uh, rice are starting to emerge. And then soybeans, uh, this is our worst performing date. It's starting to turn into corn uh, correctly as, as the, the, the crops mature, which is good to see. Um, and then the crops are starting to be harvested or dry out, showing no vegetation. And it goes back into mostly um, uh, black when, when all of the, the, the crops are either harvested or, or not showing any more vegetation. Um, so we can turn all of those uh, plots that we just created into a GIF uh, using that image.io library uh, .mem save. We'll pass in, we'll read in all of the image PNGs that we just created into a list and then write that list of images out into a GIF file format um, using this function. We can persist that GIF to the Databricks file store by copying it. And then you can either navigate to that file in the DBFS to download it to your local system, or you can display that file uh, directly in uh, Databricks using the uh, markdown. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll reload this so that the, the GIF will regenerate. Oh, live demos. Reload Databricks. All right. So now we can actually see the, that GIF going in time, uh, showing our model's performance throughout the growing season uh, for different dates, uh, along with the raw cropland data layer label um, on the left. So now we can get a holistic view of what's going on throughout the growing season and how our model is making predictions um, at, in, in real time throughout, throughout the year. So that's it for, for my demo portion. Again, uh, some, some good next steps um, for kind of iterating and improving on the model um, would be to first kind of look at the hyperparameter tuning um, and, and optimize the hyperparameters to maximize model performance um, on this data set. Um, other things that we could go back and, and change are um, if we wanted to, you know, if our goal was to get really good at predicting cultivated labels, we could do so by adding in more of those samples in our data set and our, at train time. Um, and that should help improve the model's performance on predicting uh, that cultivated label. Um, but overall, you know, in summary, uh, we are getting really solid results um, for at least predicting corn, rice, uh, soybeans, and cotton throughout the growing season in real time using Sentinel-2 imagery um, and a simple 1D CNN architecture. So, yep, that is it for the demo. Um, Yep, uh, thanks for, for tuning in to, to the training series, and I'll hand it back to John for the uh, summary. All right, thank you, Eric. Let's summarize what we've learned over this series. In parts one and two, to recap, we learned how to get the data, build the data set that we used for all subsequent work and uh, that in this case was using the cropland data layer and uh, gathering Sentinel-2 data associated with that um, over the year. And so we ended up with uh, data in the form of a time series of imagery with associated scene information, dates. Um, we learned how to put that into a binary storage format and parquet tables. Um, and then we, we subsequently uh, built a data loader that could read in in part two, those spark tables, or those those parquet tables. Um, and then we'd manipulate that through various transformations, um, such as map, shuffle, batch, prefetch, all these things to optimize the performance uh, of essentially what was a, a very optimized, efficient queue in, using the TensorFlow data sets. Finally, with that, in part three, we built a model. Uh, so the culmination of all that work 
uh, we tested the model. We saw that it performed quite well, even though it wasn't optimized at predicting various crop types in a specific test area over time. We saw that we can actually predict crop type in real time. Um, and we, we also see how the, the variations occur over time and space from uh, different um, uh, maybe uh, growth uh, rates of the crop. Um, we saw how essentially by injecting randomness into the training process, um, we could create a robust model. Um, but then we also removed that uh, randomness when we were when we were testing the data. Um, we also uh, really ultimately um, we we saw that label definition has a large large impact on model uh, on model results. Um, in this case, we we didn't have necessarily a ton of data for the cultivated crop type, um, and so you know when you actually design your model and and you 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 train it on you know with your goals, you're going to want to consider how uh, the distribution of of your data is so that you know and how that will impact the the final performance of it. Um, you know, in this case, uh, yeah, again, cultiv like cultivated was the one that clearly we had a uh, a poor performance in, um, and that was primarily due to the uh, lack of data for that particular class. Um, but yeah, so that in the end, we were able to train, uh, finally train a, a model successfully to predict crop type in real time, and uh, so that that uh, you know that was made possible with um, the various tools and methods we we showed in this training series. Uh, thank you for joining us. We hope you learned a lot, and uh, you know reach out if you have any questions. But uh, that concludes this training series. Uh, we'll go to Sean. Thanks. Thank you, John. Before we transition to the question and answer session, I want to remind everyone there is one homework assignment accessible from the training webpage. Answers must be submitted by Google Form with a due date of April 1st. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate via email approximately two months after the completion of the course. Below is the contact information for Dr. John Just and Eric Sorensen, along with links to the RSET website and social media. We hope you'll sign up on the RSET listserv to receive notifications of future trainings and follow us on social media for announcements pertaining to NASA's Earth Sciences. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's training. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box and we will get to them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training webpage by next week. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, John, we can hear you loud and clear. And All right. thank, yeah, and want to thank everybody that's been submitting their questions. We've got some really good ones. Uh, we still have plenty of time. So if you have a, a question you've been itching to ask our our, our experts, uh, John and and, uh, and Eric, please do submit your question. Uh, but jumping right into it, uh, question number one, what should we do when our target for training and testing does not exist? Is there an algorithm that can do the task? Also, if we have a series of data for a latitude longitude, how can we use it as a target data, knowing that the inputs inputs data are geotiff data? Yeah, thanks for this question. Um, and I we did we went back and forth, got a little bit of clarification on this. I think uh, it's a similar question that we've been asked um, in uh, the other sessions as well. And uh, really, this is I think this was intending to ask the question. Okay, if we don't have if we're looking at predicting crop type in an area where you know the CDL doesn't exist, which is most of the world, obviously not the U.S., um, what do you do? Well, what we've been suggesting all on here is to try and like if you got some idea of what type of crops grow in your you know in the area you're interested in, you can still uh, just sample the CDL for those types of crops um, and you know get a wide range of areas across the U.S. if you can, uh, you know from a wide range of years and um, train your model just like we do here and then and then you can go and acquire data with uh, you know the same type of script uh, scripts we have you just won't have ground truth labels um, but at that point you don't need them you just need to kind of go all right here's here's the area I want to predict on acquire the sentinel 2 data with our sit with our same scripts and then run inference like Eric did here in uh, part three so 
that's how we suggest doing it if you can. If um, gosh, if you're if you're looking at crops that don't exist in the U.S., it you know then it gets a little bit tricky. Um, you know, and and I guess if we were to talk about what to do there, we would probably say uh, you know still pre-train your model on a variety of U.S. data and years on the CDL. And then you know you'll you'll need some type of labels for the specific crop type in your country that you're uh, or area that you're looking to predict on, and so you know you but I think you'll need a lot less labels because you've pre-trained your model and you just need to fine tune it. So uh, you know hopefully that answers the the question. Great, uh, great, thank you, John. Question two: How do you create the file store directory in Databricks? Yep, so this is something that we've seen. A um, few people have issues with um, sometimes when you create the Databricks community account, the, the file store isn't natively active. Um, so we left the link here in the documentation uh, where you can follow these instructions to to enable it, uh, the Databricks file store for your Databricks community account. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Eric. Question three: Can you please provide more information about the cropland data layer? Yeah, uh, and we we actually, if you want more information on the CDL in the first part of this um, training series, the first uh, uh, training session, um, we had a lot more information about the CDL there in the slide deck. And so, you know, I'd suggest go there. Um, you know, I also put a link here to the facts, the FAQs, uh, which are fantastic for the CDL. You know, lots of information you can dive into there. Um, and uh, they, they're really comprehensive. It's a really a great source. Great, thanks, John. Question four, building such a model requires remote sensing context, agronomy, uh, DL theory, TensorFlow usage, and MLOPs. Most of the time, thematic scientists are needed to give hardware and software specifications to DevOps and ML, MLOPs to initiate model building. Some pointers on how to give the spec would be appreciated. I like this question. I think it's, a, you know, it's an interesting question in terms of implementation. Um, I think it's a it's getting outside of the science and into you know when you're dealing with like at a you know in a, in a little bit larger group or organization and trying to deploy models um, you know how how you work within that that context uh, we hesitate I mean I'm going to hesitate to give any advice here because it really depends on the infrastructure you're using um, you know there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, here's my my suggestion, uh, or the way I'm going to answer this, at least, is that if you do parts one and part two of this training series right, um, you know you've got the data, you've got the data loader set up. Uh, you you're it's really quite forgiving in terms of the type of model you use. Uh, you know the CDL uses a um, random forest. Um, you know, we use a, just a, a 1D, a small 1D convolutional neural network. So you could kind of work with your um, DevOps, ML ops people to find out what, what they know how to do, what they're comfortable with, and maybe uh, ready to implement, and then work with them to, to use that type of uh, model uh, or system to, to uh, you know, to, to deploy your, your uh, ultimately your end product. So um, I don't know, that's my suggestion, I guess. So hopefully that answers the question. Thanks, John. Question five, could you comment on how a trained model may perform when there is varying presence of clouds and images that are used for prediction? How best should we handle the presence of clouds in images? Yeah, in our example here, we're ignoring the uh, heavy cloud cover or images that contain heavy cloud cover um, by utilizing kind of this, the scene classification layer uh, to filter those out. Um, and yeah, based on our results, the we believe the model can do a pretty good job of interpolating between missing data as that'll provide, you know, the cloud covers that are filtered out will provide gaps in the bucketed time series. Um, so the model can do a good job of interpolating the data we found um, and interpolate where we have light cirrus clouds that kind of uh, provide some augmentation uh, to the to the earth surface. All right, thanks, Eric. Question six, is the training stratified so that it is equally exposed to all types? And yeah, I can answer this one as well. Um, so we didn't do stratified splits. And we, we kind of went over our approach in part two of how we uh, split the data into train validation and test splits. Um, we did it by by years. 
to avoid any possibilities of, of data leakages. So um, the train set included 2021 and 2020, I believe, um, the validation 2019 and the test 2018, or I think I might have been off by one, um, but you get the idea. Um, that was just to avoid any data leakage. And we found when we plotted the labels across the different splits uh, that the distribution of our labels was similar uh, per per the years. Thanks, Eric. Uh, question seven, how can they monitor crops temporarily? Do you train models with spectral signatures? Yeah, let me see here. Um... Okay, so uh, I, I don't know if this was answering the question, um, but we don't use, you know, we don't use any type of Fourier transforms or, or anything to deal with. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's what you're getting at uh, to deal with the time series of data. What, what we do is, you know, we're, we're essentially binning the, the data into five-day increments. And then uh, from, from there, uh, you know, we're, we're essentially using the time, we're trying to, you know, essentially use the time series of imagery where the latest image is the date that we're predicting. So, you know, if we have like, um, you know, I don't know, let's say we have uh, 60 days worth of data as an example, um, you know, the, the, the whatever the latest image is, is the date we're predicting on. So the most recent image, and then everything else is kind of considered context, similar to what, you know, you would, you would see on like LLMs and stuff like that, or any other time series data. Uh, so, you know, that's how we're able to kind of predict the models uh, in a temporal sense, you know, and it's, it's kind of like a moving window. Every time you get a new image, you kind of move that window forward and predict again. Uh, great question eight. Can I use this machine learning module for agricultural drought monitoring and risk analysis of an area? Yeah, I, I think. Uh, we've got similar questions in the past, and that's, we believe you can just by uh, changing your target data and then following the same process. So uh, all you need to really change there is your labels, I think. Great. Question nine. How does the model know it is accurately predicting no crop growing? Is that included in the CDL training data? I thought there was only one label associated with the CDL data. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, so. You're correct that the no crop growing label is not contained in the CDL. This is actually a custom label that we defined in part two that combines both uh, the cropland data layer labels um, and specifies that there's no crop growing if the time series Im of imagery uh, that we get, the last two images that we collect in that time series don't have any vegetation as detected from the scene classification layer, then we'll label it as no crops are growing because there's no recent vegetation in the image. So the way that we measure the accuracy at test time is by using our custom labeler uh, to compare the model's accuracy at predicting the this no crop growing label. Great, thanks, Eric. Question ten: If we have labels in vector format, uh, a shapefile, can we customize the code? And if so, how? Uh, yeah. So. My uh, my thought on this is just um, whatever your custom format is for uh, your labels, try to just look at the very first script in the first um, demo that we had and format your data uh, similarly to the output of our, you know, our CDL acquisition code. Um, and that's in a, like a parquet table. And if you format that, your data like that, which if you had like kind of a vector format already, shouldn't be too hard to manipulate it into that format. Then you can kind of run all the rest of the scripts um, without modification, likely. Awesome. A question 11. Do you consider that the choice of an optimizer different from Adams can modify the prediction results of the case study? Um, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any uh, different optimizers can, can affect the performance of, of the ultimately trained model. Um, so. The choice of optimizer is, is definitely something that you can play around with and, and tune as part of the hyperparameter tuning. Um, but we chose Adam because it's, it's definitely a popular optimizer. Great. And question 12 kind of follows up on fine tuning. Uh, so to fine tune a model, is there a rule of thumb on how much label data is needed against the model used? 
Yeah, this is a, it's a great follow-up question. Um, there's not really uh, any, I mean, it's really, really dependent on a lot of factors. It depends on the data you trained on, the model you're using, um, the type of thing you're trying to predict. So there's really not a rule of thumb. You have to gather a little data, try it out, see how it does. So what my suggestion is here is um, oftentimes when people will fine tune, they'll just, you know, what you're trying to do is not overfit to your fine tuning data because you usually have a very little bit of it. So you might you might have a, you know, a validation or a test set that you're reserving while you're fine tuning on, you know, part of it as well. You, you just want to make sure not to train for too many epics because you're going to overfit on your your uh, fine tuning data set. So, um, you know, that's all that's all I would say. But you're going to have to test it out and kind of it, just play around with it and see what you get and uh, and adjust accordingly. Great, thank you, John. Question thirteen: What extra inputs could we use to make our crop classification more accurate? Also, what other advanced machine learning models could we try to get better results? Yeah, so this is um, a similar question we've got previously and uh, again, a really good question. Um, I, we've always said, you know, the easiest next step would be like Landsat because um, there's a harmonized Sentinel Landsat data set. And so uh, that's the one I would go to first. Um, you could go to things like Sentinel-1. It gets, you know, gets more and more complicated because you got you got a different, a much different data source there that you got to deal with. So, um, you know, but you, but you could go to that as a next, next step and it, it would still at least be something that, you know, could, could be formatted in a similar manner with, a, with you know, sufficient massaging of the data. So um, those, those would be the first things to go to. If you had other information, which is usually hard to get like growth stage, um, I'm sure it would help. But yeah, I mean, we just kind of assume you know that that type of information is really hard to get, so we we assume it's not really a, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, we we assume that you're generally looking for remote sensing based sources. So I would start with uh, the other satellite satellite sources. Thank you, John. Question fourteen. On some plots you showed, the loss function had a narrow minimum. Is it possible to go back to the specific set of model parameters which achieved this minimum? And maybe assess whether this was an actual narrow minimum versus some kind of computation uncertainty. Yeah, this is a good question as well. Um, so the way that we have the code set up, uh, this will actually save the best model uh, in a local minimum or a narrow minimum uh, in the loss function based on the the best validation loss function. Um, this is easy to do in TensorFlow us using the uh, early stopping callback. Um, so you can just specify the early stopping callback and which which metric to track, and then it will track that that metric. And if it doesn't improve uh, over you know x amount of epochs, then it will save uh, the best performing model based on that that metric that you're tracking. So yes, this is this is pretty easy to do in TensorFlow, and, and we have this capability set up in our pipeline. Thank you, Eric. Question fifteen. Since 12 Sentinel-2 bands are used in the model, I'm wondering if it is possible to analyze which bands are not significant for the prediction. Yeah, I can take this one too. Um, so what's what's a popular approach for, for doing this with uh, neural networks is you can do like a leave one out validation analysis by training multiple models, each with differing combinations of band inputs. Um, and this should reveal if some uh, bands are, are not as impactful on the model, then those ones will um, perform better when they're left out of the model. Um, and if they're if the bands are more useful for uh, the model training purposes, then those models that leave them out will perform worse in, in reference to its peers. So yeah, the leave one out validation strategy is, is useful for this. Great, thanks Eric. Question 16. How accurate will our prediction be for a country like Ethiopia, where one farmland has mixed crops? Is there a different method we could use? So, if your farmland has mixed crops, um, you know, I still don't, I don't think that's a problem because we're we're predicting on a on a pixel level. So, you know, your your limitation is really the resolution of the satellite source you're working with. Um, you know, with that being 10 meters, uh, uh, 20, well, 
it, it's for Sentinel Sentinel two here. We're sampling into ten meters squared to make our predictions. Um, you know, if you want to, uh, I think uh, our source here was CDL data. So um, let me let me kind of clarify this. Our source data from the CDL is thirty meters squared, and so like in this particular tutorial, what you're seeing is thirty meters squared resolution, but you could get down to like once you train your model, your model could be predicting at a 10 meter square resolution. Um, there's no reason why you can't predict at a higher resolution, um, but it's gonna be up to 10 meters because that's the that's the actual, you know, um, highest resolution of bands available from Sentinel-2. So, uh, you know, there's no problem with Mitch crops in that sense, as long as whatever you train the, the, the model on from the CEL kind of matches the, the crop types you have in Ethiopia in the area you're looking at. So I think that's that's really what it's the, the your limitations are. So make sure you train on the right crop types and make sure that whatever, you know, whatever this mixed farmland is, you know, whatever resolution you need is is possible with Sentinel 2. If it's not possible with Sentinel 2, you'll need to find a higher resolution source. All right, thank you, John. Question 17, can machine learning algorithms be trained directly on satellite imagery data to generate maps without relying on a geographic information system? I would say that the answer to this question is yes. And this training is a prime example of that since we are not using a, a system of informa information geography or GIS. Yeah, and I wasn't sure if they were also referring to, let's see, you know, use use of, in this case, like a different format of data, um, like roster data. Uh, mm. you know, we can, I mean, Eric converts the data into a, kind of a roster format to, you know, or, or we do it at various stages to, to actually visualize the output. Um, but we do, just to clarify, we do work with the data in tables and in tabular format because it scales a lot nicer. Um, so you can kind of convert to uh, you know a more spatial format if if you if you need to at any point with the with the way we've structured this data. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's a okay, great. And question eighteen: What does the dot zip data that we imported into the Databricks database refer to? They are not directly created in the code. In case we want to adjust the code with our labels. Yeah, so the zip files were just, uh, they, they are, I mean, the, uh, the, I think we've had some probably blocked out uh, cells where we did use um, certain functions to create the zip files. But yeah, you, we actually, it's the same data that would be created from these scripts. Um, some of it, uh, especially in the first part when we were acquiring Sentinel-2 data, it would take too long to run in Databricks community. Um, it, your database community would keep timing out, so you have to run it many times to get all the training data. So we just we just ran it the same scripts, but in, in a in a commercial version of Databricks where it wouldn't time out and got all the data and then zipped it up. So it is all the same data, um, and you know Eric does have scripts to unzip it, and I believe there might be a cell where it's commented out that you could zip it, but um, it, it just to clarify, it is the same data that you would get from those scripts. Great. Thanks, John. Question 19. Could you share your thoughts on using a hyperspectral sensor for this analysis? I understand that the current status is less frequent, so even building the time series data would be challenging, though. Um, depends on the source of your, your data. I mean, if you think of uh, hyperspectral as just being more bands than multispectral, um, you know, I, I'm, it depends on where your source is, though. Uh, when I think of hyperspectral, I think of like spectrometers and a time series of spectrometry uh, data. You know, you have you have way more bands. Like, um, so you could still apply these same methods in some sense, but now your your data source is completely different, right? So you're not dealing with sat you're you're not dealing with um, you know satellite data. You're dealing with uh, more of a you know, whatever whatever source of, of data you're getting from. Like, uh, when I think of a hyperspectral sensor, uh, I think of a spectrometer that's used to measure grain and you're sampling at one hertz or something like that. So then you have a consistent time series. And, um, 
you know, that that's, in my opinion, yeah, all this applies. It's actually a little bit, I think it's an easier problem, depending on if you have the, the ground truth or not for it, though. So um, it's getting a little bit, I, I think, it, the way I understand this is getting a little bit outside of maybe what we were targeting for the training. But, um, you know, similar methods would apply. Uh, and if you're if you're if you have a consistent sampling frequency, you don't have to worry about fins like cloud cover and stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, I I can't say that I'm a hundred percent sure I'm answering this question right. At least per the intention. Great, yeah, really really great question. So thank you to, to everybody that's been submitting. Uh, we do have. Five minutes. Uh, if there's any last lingering question out there, if anybody's been itching to ask and for some reason they didn't, uh, please do so because your your time is quickly uh, winding down. I, I did want to remind everybody that there will be a survey sent out to all of you within probably by the end of this week. And we do encourage and we hope that you'll take the five to ten minutes that it will take to to uh, complete that survey. We greatly value the feedback that all of you give to us after each of these trainings. We go through all of the uh, data points that you sent to us. We try to iterate, make these trainings better of higher value to each of you. So uh, please, to the community that is interested in training such as these, uh, please do take the time uh, that it will take to, to complete the survey. And again, uh, we, we greatly value that. And we, we look forward to going through the feedback that you're going to give from this training. So uh, I guess John and Eric, you know, Thank you. It looks like we got through all the questions, unless there's any lingering ones that do come through. Uh, as we wrap up this incredible webinar series, and thank you guys both so much for making this so impactful to all the participants, uh, just interacting with them, I can I can say it's been incredibly positive so far. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have any uh, maybe concluding or, or, or uh, closing comments to any of the participants. Yeah. Um, so uh, I was just answering one last question here in the chat, but. Um, you know, we really enjoyed putting this together. It was a lot of work to kind of put together the data acquisition scripts and test out models and kind of getting all working. But, um, you know, we learned this, uh, this how to do this uh, at scale over several years and deal with some of these um, non ideals. And so we hope that you guys can kind of uh, have your learning and your starting point kind of accelerated by uh, taking, taking this and applying it to whatever research you're doing. Uh, reach out and let us know. Um, if you got any cool applications, um, you know, we always love to hear what people are doing and, uh, just know that, you know, uh, as long as you, I think one, one thing I'll say is as long as you get part one and part two, right? So if you get your data and you format it correctly and you get your data loader working, right? Um, you know, the model is quite forgiving. And so, uh, you know, people tend to focus on the modeling a lot, but, uh, if you get your data, right, uh, formatted, right, you can do, you, it's quite forgiving. So. But uh, yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for tuning in, and we we appreciate the opportunity to work with the RSET team. Yeah, and I'll just uh, echo echo what John said. We're very excited to to see uh, what people you know do with this uh, data pipeline and modeling process. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out if you you know have any further questions or uh, if you have some really neat results um, utilizing this process for your uh, your own domains. Um, and then, yeah, definitely thanks for everybody's participation in the chat. Um, it's very engaging a uh, chat and, uh, thanks for the RSET team for making this process for creating this. This uh, series, so, so, uh, streamlined and easy to do. So, um, yeah, appreciate it and thanks all. Well, uh, John and Eric, I think the, 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 the big thanks definitely go to you too. Uh, thank you guys both so much for contributing. This has been such an awesome webinar series. We have thoroughly enjoyed working with you and, and. I really hope, uh, and just judging from the feedback that we've gotten just, uh, you know, uh, preliminarily, uh, it's been of high value to the community. So hopefully the materials will live on on the training page. Uh, they'll be able to be on YouTube. So people will be able to access in perpetuity. And so we really hope that, you know, this is, uh, has a big impact in the community. So uh, thank you both so much. I, I want to acknowledge the RSET team. Uh, you might not have heard their voices, uh, but they've been working tirelessly in the background. Uh, that's Natasha Johnson Griffin, Brock Blevins, Selwyn Hudson Odoi. Jonathan O'Brien and Sarah Cutchall. So thanks to our set team for, for helping to put this webinar series together. And lastly, we want to thank all of you that joined over these three weeks. Uh, we know that, you know, you probably all have very busy schedules. So thank you all for joining wherever you're joining from. And we do hope to see you again at a future RSET training. So be well, take care, and we hope to see you again soon.